I'm excited today to talk about chirality in amino acids because I think chirality is just kind of an interesting concept sort of in general. And of the 20 amino acids that make up all proteins, 19 of them are chiral. And that's really important because that impacts their chemistry. It impacts kind of the way that they are um, put together. It impacts the functionality of them. Um, and we'll kind of talk about why. So as a reminder, if you haven't seen the word chiral or talked about chirality or thought about chirality recently, first of all, cool word. It comes from the Greek, of course, of course it does, either Greek or Latin. It comes from chire, which means hand, which is kind of a cool thing, um, I think. I'm, I'm kind of a language nerd, so. Uh, take that with a grain of salt then if you don't think it's cool. So chirality really means handedness and it what we mean by handedness is that we can have kind of mere images of, of things and, and kind of the glove is the usual example. So I have a glove here. Here's, um, you know, kind of my right-handed glove and here's my left-handed glove. So if I have my right and my left-handed glove and I put them uh, side by side like this, then we can see that they're mirror images of each other, right? If I was to put a mirror in between them, it would look exactly as if I was holding the other glove up to it, mirror images of each other, right? So here's the back of the one, it's a mirror image, front, back. But if I was trying to superimpose them, so to put one on top of the other, I love how gigantic my gloves look, but it's just the proximity of my document camera here. They look like I wear oven mitts for, for winter, but that's okay. I'm okay with that. Okay, so if I try to superimpose them like this, you can see that they don't line up. So even though they're mirror images of each other, right, I can't make one become the other when I set them on top of each other. So that superimposition piece where I lay one on top of the other, hands are the same way, right? So that's... Um, kind of a visual, at least from everyday life, in talking about handedness. And this is important in molecules, and we see it especially in organic molecules with carbon, because carbons can be chiral, and these chiral carbons have tetrahedral geometry. So remember, a tetrahedron is this kind of four-sided pyramid, and all of my angles internally here are 109.5 degrees. So I have carbon here, which is my black one at the center, with this tetrahedral geometry. But instead of having four of the same thing, or even four of, or multiple of the same thing, I have to have everything that it's connected to be a different thing. That's what a chiral, a chiral carbon is. That's what chirality is in carbon-containing molecules. It's a lot of C's there in one, in one package. Chiral-containing carbon, carbon, chiral, chiral carbon containing say that five times fast. Okay, so we have carbon. I have four different things attached to it. That's a chiral carbon. Usually we will um, note it in a structure with a an asterisk there. So that indicates that it's a chiral carbon. You've probably seen this notation before. In the case of amino acids, the alpha carbon is the one that we're looking at. And this allows for a specific type of isomerism called enantiomers and enantiomers are left and right-handed isomers and we can designate the two so there's a couple different types of structural isomers um, where we can kind of put them together and do change around the bonding patterns that gives us you know like branched alkanes for example if we're thinking about organic there's um, stereoisomers like cis trans isomers where you're you're inhibited by a double bond or a ring structure and so one can't become the other. With enantiomers, you have these mirror images, these molecules that are mirror images of each other, but I can't superimpose one on the other, like my gloves. So I have two different versions. And so the left one we call the L isomer, whatever it is, and the right one we call the D isomer. And this has to do with, um, with polarized light and the way that they, they're also called optical isomers because of the way that they mess with light. So the L and the D have to do with the designation of the way that the light shifts when they're looking at these things. Okay, so let's look at an example. Let's take alanine. Alanine is often used when we're talking about enantiomers, mostly because I think it's kind of the smallest and the easiest to see. So 
When I draw it on a two-dimensional surface like this, here's my mirror. I'm drawing it like my left and right hands, right? So these are kind of the mirror images of each other. So I've kind of drawn it that way, but I'm still limited by this two-dimensional surface. I've been, I'm trying to show a little bit of the angles here. So this trigonal planar geometry kind of gives me those 120 degree angles. So I'm trying to show that a little bit, but if I identify my alpha carbon, which again is going to be the one that has the carboxylic acid group, the amine group, and a hydrogen. So at least those three component pieces. This is my alpha carbon then. And same here, I have my amine group, my carboxylic acid group, my hydrogen, here's my alpha carbon. So my R group here is just this methyl that is sticking off at the bottom. That's that side group or side chain. So the methyl kind of being the simplest one, alanine is often used to describe this because they get kind of complicated kind of quickly. All right, so when I look at these, they look the same to me. And I, it's kind of hard to see that they're two different isomers of each other, two different ways of putting these together, unless we kind of break out the modeling kit. That's what I like to do. I like to break out the blocks. Any opportunity I have to play with the modeling kit is a good one. So. What I have here is kind of, this is the structure that's on my right, the right of the screen here. This is the structure that's on the left. And so these guys are mirror images of each other. And yet if I was trying to make one into the other, so if I'm trying to line them up the same way, we can see that they aren't going to be super imposable, right? Because my carboxylic acid group is in the wrong spot. So they are mirror images of each other, but I can't superimpose them. So if I go back to the way it was here, here's my mirror images. Can't superimpose. That means that we have enantiomers of each other. So again, kind of a tricky thing to see. It's kind of a hard thing. I think it's easier to think about in theory than it is sometimes to see it in molecules, but that's what we're practicing with. We're practicing with different ways we can represent molecules, either in a two-dimensional way, getting our brains around how they look in three dimensions, and kind of what we can do from there. So we would say then that this carbon is chiral. It has tetrahedral geometry, so it has four things around a central atom, and each of those groups is a different thing. So I have my amine, my carboxylic acid, my hydrogen, that everyone has, right? But those are three different groups. And then my R group is a different thing. Okay, and that's gonna be true of 19 out of 20 of those amino acids. But the exception to that is the one where the R group is just a hydrogen. So let's talk about glycine. We say that glycine is achiral, meaning without a chiral center, without a chiral carbon in this particular case. So we have one that's achiral, the rest of the 19 are chiral. And this is kind of important again, and we'll kind of come back to it because it's important to be able to classify. We're scientists, so we like to categorize and classify the different things, but it's also important because the shape of a molecule is going to influence its function. And so the different functional groups that are on these things and the orientation and where they sit in space are all going to impact and influence the way that these molecules do chemistry in a biological context. That's kind of what biochemistry is all about. So it's important to be able to get our heads around what kinds of things are going to influence the chemistry of these molecules. Now hopefully you're looking at this and saying, Okay, I've found my alpha carbon. This is the one that's attached to my amine group, my carboxylic acid group, and a hydrogen. And what's left over here is another hydrogen. So it's at least tetrahedrally coordinated, if we're thinking about our definition of chiral carbon, but not all four of the groups are different. So if I'm thinking about my molecule here, I'm gonna do a little surgery on my alanines here. Sorry, such a mess. Okay, so here's one of them. So here's my carboxylic acid group. Here's my amine group. Here's my two hydrogens. If I do some surgery on my other alanine here, and I say, well, here's my mirror image to that guy. Okay, so here's my mirror, mirror images of each other. And my groups here are my hydrogens. The problem is that if I wanted to, then I could rearrange these things 
if I kind of do some reorganization here, then I can make one become the other. I can superimpose one onto the other, and they're the same molecule, right? So they are superimposable, which means that they aren't enantiomers, which means that alpha carbon there at the center is not a chiral carbon. It's an achiral carbon. So that's an important piece to kind of be aware of. It's still an alpha carbon because it's still that centerpiece of my amino acid, but it's not chiral. Now let's go back to our alanine then, now that we've kind of talked about what they are and what they aren't, because now that we have a better sense of that, then we can say, well, what makes these things special? Why are we even having this conversation? Well, we're having this conversation is because this is my L version, L-alanine, and this is my D version, D-alanine, and without getting into a whole bunch of detail about why, again, it has to do with the way that light is polarized, if we kind of look at it, we can kind of see kind of everything is hanging off of the left on this side, if we look at our amine group here, and then versus the amine group here. So it's all about positioning of things. But this is my L-alanine, and the reason that it matters, the take-home message of probably this entire video, of all of my ramblings, <laughs> is that nature likes the L version. So as we've learned in organic chemistry, if you throw together the component pieces and put the right conditions there, you can help selectively make some particular types of molecules more than others. You can have major products and minor products. If we think about things like Markovnikov's rule, we can create certain pressure temperature combinations where we get to specific solids, for example, or specific phases or specific um, ways that these things are going to combine together to give us the product that we're looking for. And for nature, nature likes this L, the left-handed version of these enantiomers. So all of the proteins that you see in your body, well, you're not going to see them, but all of the proteins that are in your body are going to be the L enantiomer. They're going to be made up of L enantiomer amino acids. And so that's an important piece to know because if we were taking supplements or if we were trying to make synthetic amino acids in a lab in order to use for some sort of biological purpose, and we made the D enantiomer, but then it wouldn't do anything for us, right? Because it's not going to have the right shape for the function in our bodies. So the isomer matters, the isomerism matters, and the orientation matters. And so that's why we're having this conversation about chirality, because this is a unique and interesting thing about amino acids, because of the commonalities of their structure, that they have these things hanging off of this central carbon. It allows for this particular type of isomerism, but nature likes the left-handed version. All right, if you have any questions on this, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, we'll talk again soon.